Let's go. Somebody say, let's go. Let's go. Y'all know it's a totally different mindset, huh? I think this jersey reminded me. It really did. And I really wore this because this, this was my jersey when I walked on. This is my jersey, uh, my, uh, my jersey number in college. And I knew there was going to be some Jackson State people here. And uh, I just want them to know um, that they're already defeated because so- <laughs> Southern plays them uh, this weekend. Somebody say Southern will win. Okay, I got a couple of y'all, all right? Mr. Eddie and Carolyn and Sister Lois, they're not going to do anything to y'all. That's Jackson State guys. But no, let's stay with it. Let's stay with it right now. So God is getting ready to speak to us through the preacher, Solomon. We know about the book Ecclesiastes. Minister Kenny did an amazing job last week. I mean, outstanding. You have to choose joy. It's a choice. Everybody say it's a choice. I'm sharing with you right now, your life can change right now if you make the choice. Or you and I could have the belief that it's just a continual, and you don't know when you're going to get there. You have to understand that you have the ability to be great right now. Somebody say right now. Right now. That means great as a husband, great as a, a wife, great as a pastor, great as a senior, great as a community person, great in school. Great, all of those that are viewing this service live stream, we are called to be great. And somebody say, I, I am, am called to be great. And greatness means you've taken the time to perfect your gift, know what your gift is, and you're operating effectively or you're training to get yourself effective. Because he says, whoever must Whoever wants to be the greatest among you, he's talking about the kingdom. Whoever wants to be the greatest among you, but it's a principle that'll work in the world. Whoever wants to be greatest among you, that's what Jesus said. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. When Jesus is talking, you need to listen. Sometimes I think we're putting other authors on on par with Jesus. And when you read something that's by another author, make sure you understand it doesn't have the original content. It has somebody that's coming through somebody. Y'all understand that? So you always reference whatever you're reading back to the Word of God. Otherwise, you'll read stuff, and it won't be true, and you'll try to build your life on it. The lady that wrote the book about adulting that impacted a lot of millennials, and you, millennials, and you heard millennials talking about adulting. Adulting, what the millennials mean. Can anybody here tell me what they understand? Adulting? Adulting. How many have heard that term? Adulting. All right? Any millennials can tell me what that means? What does that mean? You've heard it, but you don't know what it means. Anybody? Acting like an adult. Acting like an adult. Or you now a millennial and you realize you got to pay your bills. Whereas your parents were paying them. In other words, you're now stepping into the reality of life. You now are adulting. In other words, you are now responsible for your own personal development. Now mom is not going to wake you up to go to work like she was doing when you were going to school everybody got it and so the lady that wrote the book actually backtracked off it she renounced it she said I was just talking to a friend at a bar when I wrote when I talked about that stuff and then I put it in there I really don't believe a whole lot of it what she was saying was that book led a lot of millennials into thinking that not listening and carrying on what your parents taught you you didn't need it. It's like old school. I was talking to my daughter and uh, uh, Deion Sanders, a good friend of mine, coach at Jackson State, still my boy, but we're going to beat him on uh, Saturday. If y'all don't know Southern playing <laughs> Jackson State Saturday, all right? He said he used to get a word from God um, for his team before a game. He usually has a word from God, and he'll give it to the team. And he told the team this recently, last week for the homecoming, Peter, he told the team, he said, I, I, I went to God for a word for y'all before the game, and I didn't get any. He said, but I got one. He said, you, he said a lot of y'all don't know old school parents. He said, old school parents, they didn't keep talking to you over and over again. Mm-hmm. Am I in the right place? Yeah. That's what he said. He said, old school parents, they didn't talk to you. He, he said, you know, when, when they told you to do something and you didn't do it, 
He said, you know that look? He said, a lot of y'all don't know about that look. He said, you, you don't know about that look. And he was using the reference to his team. When they go outside and see the opponent, they shouldn't have to do all that talking. All they got to do is look over there. And that team should know y'all in trouble. Come on. Come on. Didn't I make that real to you? Y'all understand? Do you know that's the way the devil should be with us? That's right. We still praying and, and singing about breakthroughs? You are a breakthrough. God has given you the ability. He has his spirit in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. That means he can help you stop overeating. He can help you with that nasty attitude that you refuse to let go. He can help you with this up and down. I can usually tell how people are doing. Because most people, believers, wear their attitude on their sleeves, their countenance. Your countenance says a lot about you. Who wants to be drawn to somebody that's sitting in church every week and have a prune face? If we would just shift and allow the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is your helper. That was the big point in the 9 a.m. service. I need what? The Holy Spirit is your helper. He'll help you in your marriage. He'll help you in your single state. He'll help you have the right connection in a virtual meeting. Here's the other thing to all my virtual folk and all my seniors. Learn how to use devices. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I've been in pastor school for over, it'll be the fourth month in November. The guy who's teaching it is 70 years old, one of the most effective pastors in all the world. And that man is still reading and learning as if he's a teenager. Now, what's our problem? You're not reading. You're still the same person. Ten years. Those days are over. You got to read. You got to grow. This salvation wasn't so you can just drag your behind through life and then somebody preach a eulogy and just speak well of you. That's what Solomon talking about. Wake up, man. It doesn't matter how old you are. The streets don't work. We already know. It doesn't work. It's not a long-term deal. God has called you out. He's called you out so you will be effective. You'll get to know Jesus Christ so you can get these young cats and save generations, man. You're, everybody around here serving, man, learn what you're doing. Learn what you're doing so somebody can come learn from you. Come on. Hello, pastor on fire up in here. Yes, I am because I'm on fire with myself. It's enough, man. Yes. I'm telling you, when you go out and you do what God has called you to do, it gives you so much joy and peace. Some of your depression will go away if you just become effective and productive. Some of us, it's like Groundhog's Day. <laughs> There's no intentional growth at all. And if you don't have intentionality about growth, you won't grow. Those days are over, man. Either you're going to go, I should say, either you're going to grow or you're going to go. Because there are some people out there who the world, and they are very talented, very gifted. They have no peace. If they can get Jesus, if they can get born again, you talking about world changers? I like to tell people, they always talk about our hoods, our community so bad, all oh, pray for the young people. No, pray for the people making decisions that's impacting these people. Amen. Amen. It was elected officials who sold and selling all the land to China and the foreign countries. Right under our nose and you voting black and white. You, you, I, don't, I really need to have a soberness to you. If we don't do what we're supposed to do, if you keep up with that Democrat and that Republican foolishness, when you did, trust me and believe what I'm telling you, 
Because if you don't go and read the Bible and see, God has to correct wickedness. Yes. And what he would do is he would allow nations that repeatedly ignored him. Believers that com- repeatedly ignores him. He allowed them to be in captivity. A lot of stuff you think is the devil, it ain't the devil. The Lord allowing it to happen because he's trying to change you. Some of y'all mad at people, got trauma, and the people was right there trying to tell you something that you didn't want to hear. Sometimes the millennials, we got trauma in my parents. Well, sometimes parents who, for whatever reason, didn't always say it right. But you were frustrating that parent because they kept telling you the same thing over and over again. And then they yell, and then they cuss, and they, they're not supposed to do any of that. But we wouldn't have none of that if you had just obeyed the first time. Man, I just feel like running up and down these stairs. <laughs> the stairs, I say stairs. Yeah, stairs and the chairs. Somebody say, let's go. Let's go. So we're in the book of Ecclesiastes. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1. Somebody say 7, verse 1. Seven, verse one. This is a completer. What you're going to find out, you're, Solomon... Solomon literally is, let me, let me give you a quick refresher. I'll give you a quick refresher. And in in, in anybody that's communicated, you're, they're adding information. You don't have to go all the way back through everything, right? So Minister Kenny talked about, uh, Minister Kenny talked about choosing. Anybody remember what he said? You have to choose what? Anybody remember? You have to choose it. You have to be a choice. So some of us wait until the situation changes before we choose to, to be happy or be joyous. Solomon, getting ready, he's getting ready to teach us in his old age after he had literally got out of favor with God. His heart was turned, but God made him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe he was dictating to a scribe that was putting it in print. The things he learned that he want to teach us so we don't have to go through the same things. If we're going through the same stuff that other people went through, that means we're not learning. Y'all got it? A good name is better than precious ointment. You can say a good name is better than wealth. A good name is better than riches. Somebody say a good name. name. Now, most people stop at a good name meaning Okay, you know Pastor Nia, so you know a little bit about me. And y'all will say, you know he's a good pastor. But who knows the real me? That's not a deep question. Y'all can answer. Who knows me? The real me? You say Pastor T. Not even Pastor T know the real me. How many people been married to somebody and for 30 years then found out you didn't really know him? Can I get a, don't put your hand up in case the camera's wrong. <laughs> no. There's one person, you, your spirit know you, and God knows you. Everybody else, we're subject to perform for. You can sit here all day. God knows you're not tied to. And I'm certainly not going to harp about it. That's on you. I know what he's going to do. Pastor Pastor T and I, we know what the word does. And nobody falling or somebody doing something wrong doesn't change the word of God. Just because somebody's speeding past you don't mean you got to go speed. I guess one of the worst things an officer can pull, pull a person over and they say, why are you speeding? And then you say, well, you didn't see them speeding? How childish could you be? <laughs> somebody said they did it, and somebody asked, did it work? A good name is better than what? Come on. This is a strong statement. And part of what Solomon is doing, he's causing us to contrast what we thought was hard times, what we thought was difficulty. He's now getting ready to tell us, that's the part you need to be rejoicing more in. He's teaching you because you can't control hard times. You didn't know necessarily a pandemic was coming, but do you know that pandemic had opportunities? Mm -hmm. You know God has always advanced his people, even in the midst of what looked like tragedies? Did you know Jeremiah 
was told that his uncle, I think, is going to come try to sell him some, sell him some land. In the place God told him, he's taking the land from him and giving him to an enemy. Do you know that uh, Jeremiah was told that his uncle will come and sell you some land in the area I told you I'm getting ready to run y'all out of? Because God is a setup. And crisis has a dual meaning. It means danger and it means opportunity. Mm-hmm. And the carnal will see the danger. Who are the carnal? Those that are saved but living carnal lives. Born again. Some of the carnal are get wrapped up and die in the invasion. Because some people God told Jeremiah, go tell them, go tell them this. I'm getting ready to judge Israel. Here's what's getting ready to happen. I will send an enemy force to conquer this land and tell that king, don't resist. If he resists, he's going to die. Tell him to go. And that's how they end up in Babylon. He said, if they go, even though they'll be enslaved, they will be alive and I'll be able to work with them. That's how you get Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because God controls the good and the bad. Oh, I just want to stay here for a second. God controls what? I hear some of y'all saying, I hear you right now. I hear your pushback. Oh, no, no, that's kind of the devil. I got a question for you. I just got one question for you. I think he taught us through the book of Job that Satan can't do nothing he doesn't allow. See, we got to get out of this fairy tale, God, that you've made up to make it palatable for you. They don't even read the Old Testament anymore. I'm sorry he won't let me not read it because it's all connected. All of this is wisdom so we can learn what Solomon is going to tell us, Sister Barbara, at the end of this book that he didn't listen to. He's going to tell us the end of the matter. You stop chasing all these pleasures. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Power, a position, pride of life. The three killers of man. Solomon has experienced it, and the Holy Spirit made sure that man sat down and wrote it all. Because the book Ecclesiastes, it comes, it starts out uh, Ecclesiastes come from the word ecclesia, which is the word church. The word church means assembly, a called out assembly. I've said it before. I'm saying it again because some of you all still don't know it and couldn't explain it to somebody who asked you why you go to church and what is a church. Church comes from the word ecclesia, which this word is derived from e- uh, Ecclesiastes called out. I'm calling you out. I'm telling you from my man Solomon who ignored my wisdom, who was one of the wisest guys to live. I'm telling you, stop going after just pleasures. Stop trying to please people and learn to honor God no matter how young or old you are. Fear the Lord and everything going to go well. And look what he says. And a good name is better then precious ointment, or a good name in Proverbs 15, 30, talks about a good name. It's better than riches and gold. Somebody say a good name. Good name. But how did he put this conjunction in this proverb? It's a proverb. How did he put this conjunction here to connect the two? Don't seem like they connected. And the day of death, then the day one's born. I started to put a picture for somebody, a baby being born, and somebody in a casket. Solomon is telling us the day of your death. Everybody see that? Is what? It's better. Why would he say that? Why would he say that? One of the ways you can interpret this as a good name is better. How many of y'all know you have to be on your P's and Q's to keep a good name? And a good name seems Hard to get, but easy to lose. Am I right? Absolutely, right? That's why people uh, 
inherit restaur uh, restaurants or corporations, a lot of times the third generation loses it. They usually lose it. But people like the Vanderbilts or the Rockefellers, they put things in place where the knucklehead kids can't mess it up. You got to put things in place. That's what God did. Do you know God has things in place? Go read Galatians 4. Do you know God has an inheritance for you that you can't receive until you grow up? How God going to release whatever he has to you? you, you you're not speaking to people. How are you going to give somebody full authority to represent you and they still dealing with people, still not listening to people, don't even understand that you put people in charge and that he'll, you will work through people? I am, I'm telling you, I have, something is in me that's saying it's time to get rid of these old stinky attitudes. Stink in attitudes. And a name, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Come on, let's, let's, let's dissect that for a second. Why do you think he's saying that? Come on, put it in the chat. Why do you think he's saying that? Why do you think he's saying that? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Say it again. You get to go to be with the Lord then? Okay. Anybody else? Here's what I do know about death. That once you die, you can't mess up your reputation. The opportunity to mess it up is now over. He might be saying that because he's jacked this thing up. The other thing people don't realize about the Ecclesiastes, because he's going to say some crazy stuff later on in this chapter, that a lot of these books were written to men. And whoever's teaching it have to make sure they give the female perspective and the male perspective. Because he's going to say later on, down in this, in this chapter, he, could, he said, one in a thousand men are faithful. And you know what he said about women? And he said, I can't find one. That's what he said. Right. People don't put that, they don't read that in the book because they think it's going to offend people. But yeah, I guess you don't if you can't explain it because you don't understand. What Solomon's talking about is his experience. He's been messing with foreign women. He's been marrying king's daughters. He's been marrying women that didn't love him, that it was a business transaction. So a lot of these women he had in his hand room, they didn't really love him like that. They were, all, they, were, they were proxies put in for their daddies. So his perspective about women is going to be limited. Hello. Yeah. Because we already have the word of God about a Proverbs 31 woman. He says, a, a faithful wife who can find. That's what kingdom women is supposed to be. Man, the line should be long for men looking for our women here. Because you ain't looking for a man to make you put your name and give you some money. You got your own stuff. You, got, you bring something to the table. Shout out to my girl, Pastor T. Y'all know it's her birthday today. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. You talking about a virtuous woman now. This is a football reference. I, I, I'll kick my coverage when I marry Pastor T. Some of y'all don't know about football. Don't even worry about it. All it is is meaning uh, I didn't really know what I was even doing. God just, in spite of my ignorance, gave me an amazing woman of God. And I thank God for it. Amen. Yeah. Can we shout out Pastor T? Happy birthday, girl. The other thing Solomon is doing here is we have to have a better attitude with what we call negative things. Death is not a negative. Next verse, please. It is better to go to the house of mourning. He's getting ready to build on this. He's getting ready to say, you have to start putting a smile on your face even when things are difficult. Yes. Yes. Amen. Anybody could be happy. Anybody could be happy when everything's going well. But do you know you are not called to a place where it's all going to be happy? Y'all know that? Come on, look, look up here. Please mute your phones. Look up here. Don't let that distract you. L mute your phones. <laughs> Y'all be surprised what crossed my mind when I'm up here. <laughs> 
I'm going to tell you all what was going through my mind. Get that phone and throw it, out, uh, throw it out that window somewhere. All right, I'm just joking, just joking. All right. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of what? Feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to what? Heart. Something is supposed to happen when you go to funerals. When I went and saw that movie Till, it did something for me. Emmett Till is a movie about Emmett Till. It's not even a whole, about, a whole lot of movie theaters. It did something for me. Say that again. Made you grateful, I bet. Not only, yeah, grateful. Or also, what's our excuse? What's our excuse? That's the kind of stuff I think about, man. I can't imagine being enslaved where people do that kind of stuff. I can't imagine that. What's our excuse? What's our excuse? You really have to ask yourself that question. What is our excuse? And we can have them now. And we can say, well, you know, we're in a different generation and all that kind of stuff. You are a mighty woman and uh, man of God. You are a prince or a princess if you're not married and don't have any children. You are king or queen. You are supposed to be dominating, but not through brute force. You're supposed to be able to speak to stuff because you're in line with God. When you're in line with God, all of his anointing will flow through you and your area of influence. So all you got to do is speak to something. And your prayers, you should already be calling your children in because they're the seed of the righteous. I don't care what they're going through. Stop looking at what you see. We walk by faith, not by sight. You've heard that so many times that it become a cliche for you. Walk by faith meaning I call it what God says it is, not what I'm currently seeing. Yes. By his stripes I need to heal, I'm not. Amen. This knee was bothering me, I think I told you all Sunday. It was bothering me. But I already laid hands on it. And when you lay hands and believe you heal, God is going to give you remedy things what, what to do. Do you know he told me, okay, I need you because I hadn't, I've been traveling, I hadn't done my creed core steps. He said, go do the creed, for, creed, for, creed for course steps like you normally do. Now, that don't sound right if your knee hop hurt it. But when you have Dr. Jesus, Amen. and he knows the root cause behind stuff, everything you need right inside you. Amen. The Holy Spirit is called a paraclete, one that comes alongside to aid. But he's not rude. And he's not forceful. He won't intrude in your life without you asking him to help you. You got to ask him to help your children, help you have conversations with your children. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Why would he say that, ladies and gentlemen? Come on. Come on. Why do y'all think he's saying that? Give me feedback. Stop looking at your Bibles. Y'all have read a whole, heard a whole bunch of this stuff. It's, it, it, let's do some catechism. Why do you think it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting? For that is the end of all men or women, and the living will lay it to his heart. Hello? You say changes your perspective? Okay. Yes. Is it because Solomon knew what was up under the sun was vain? I'll just repeat it right now. Yes. Say it again. Mm-hmm. And going to the house of feast means they're having a good time, but he knows no good in that. Correct. That's a good one, too. Who else? Anybody else? Yes. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that there's a scripture that says that we should mourn when somebody is born. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of it, what he wants to infer in here is to remember there will be accountability after you die. Yeah. And if I can get people to forget about that accountability and that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I can get us to kind of just, just coast. But when you go to a funeral, you realize you're going to be there. It's coming unless Jesus comes. And are you ready? Are you ready? Got a question for you. At any point over the past week, 
Did Jesus knock on your door and you didn't open it because of what you were doing? I'm going to just take my time and look. How about this one? Was there something going on inside of you, you were thinking a certain way, that if Jesus knocked on the inside of your door, would you have kept him out? It's quiet in this place. You go to the house in the morning, you start thinking about that. Man, I'm, I may not be here as long as you think. I know we think we're going to live long, and we should number our days. But not one of you know when you're going to die. All I want to know is where I'm going to die. Some of them look at me. I've said this before. If I find out where I'm, where I'm going to die, I won't go there. <laughs> so here it is. It's better to go to the house of mourning. The other principle I want you to keep listening to is, Solomon is also through God's wisdom telling us there's beauty in difficult, challenging times. Somebody dying, there's potential beauty there. There's a potential lesson there. Y'all got it? And he says, feasting, for, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay what? Lay it to what? It's right there. Lay it to what? Do y'all know this all about the heart? I'll stop here for a second. Do you know this whole thing is about you getting born again and now you live from the inside? And to the degree we understand that, anything that's happening in here and we're allowed to happen in here is going to happen out here? Do you know the war is supposed to be defeated in here? Did y'all know that? Let me see if I can give you a recent example. Sometimes people have things that they're thinking in their hearts. Um, I'll, I'll think of a couple. Has anybody had something in your heart? Recently, somebody reached out to us and, and said that they thought uh, somebody they know said something. And it, this is a believer. The person been saved for a while. And they said, somebody said something about them. And the first question I ask, you know what the first question I ask? Yeah. They're a believer. Been, been saved for a long time. People sitting right in here. They've been saved a long time. You know what I ask? It was something that they heard somebody say to them. And, that's, and they, they were upset about it. So the first question I asked them was what? Have you talked to that person? And what was the answer? That's why I know Satan can shut off most of the body of Christ. Because very few have enough boldness to go have a conversation with somebody. And you will zap the anointing out of your life so fast you won't believe it. You got to have these conversations. If your brother has ought against you, or you think your brother has ought against you. It said, leave your gift at the altar. Let me make sure we get it scripturally right. It didn't say take it. It said leave it. And then go be reconciled to your brother. Y'all got it? Because God is not so much concerned about your money as he is the relationships. Because all people are going to know we're, our, we're, we're his disciples by our what? Love for one another. So if there's going to be an attack on uh, the body of Christ, it's going to be on your love toward one another. Guarantee. Guarantee. How about this one at a funeral? How many of you go to a funeral and you realize, man, what I'm tripping on? Why am I holding this in? Or when you first get a diagnosis of cancer or something and it looks terminal, all of a sudden they start thinking about, man, well, why was I pouting? All my life, why, why was I worrying about this stuff? Do you have to get sick to get this stuff right? Who you think allowed a sickness? Satan. Say it again. Satan. No. I didn't say Satan didn't do it. I say who allowed it. Oh, I did. There's a lesson in it. 
And possibly you'll get healed if you deal with this foolishness that may be attacking your body and you don't even know why. See it all the time. Remember, he's a thief. Yeah. Tiffany, a thief does not know, want you to know how he's getting in your house. And I see it all the time, bitterness and unforgiveness. Oh, Christians talk a good game, but you can see their behavior change. That's why they're not able to witness to loved ones, because they still go up and down based on the behavior of the loved one. When you're supposed to be a thermostat, that you're supposed to set the temperature. Of course, your loved one coming in drunk. That's all they know. That's why God has sent a Jason up here for anybody that was here on worship night. Because you know that man right there, how old are you, Archie? He knows, and Jason, what, 34? Jason is 39. He knows that a guy like that is going to see him walking, and he's going to obey his voice and pick that man up. And the man, been, uh, how far away from here he, he lives? About 15 miles, something like that? 13 miles. And he was catching bus and walking here. And then God showed Archie the guy walking. And then they connected, not knowing each other. That's what God's looking to do. That's what God's looking to do. Can he do that through you? Can he do that through you? Or will the news keep the church so afraid of your own shadow? Well, you know, you got to be careful these days. You got to lock your car. You got to put a club on your steering wheel while you're driving. <laughs> the church scared as I don't know what. No more. You'd be surprised what kind of pay God will give you if you just avail yourself. Some of your breakthroughs have just come through your service. Last statement. Um, he told Nebuchadnezzar, he said, look, man, you got all this pride going on. You had a dream that, in essence, you're going to lose your kingdom. And then Daniel gave him some advice. He said, look, Nebuchadnezzar, show mercy to the poor. Show mercy to the poor. Repent of your sins. Show mercy to the poor. And he said, perhaps God will hear your heart and change his judgment on you. Show mercy to the poor. When we hear Jason and hear a story about the streets, it is so enlightening. Because if you haven't been in the streets for a long time, you have a distance from it. You don't understand it, what it's like to be in those circles. And then God has sent us in them so we can get people out. But when they come in here, the last thing they want to see is phoniness. Last thing they want to see is people talking about each other. That's what that man said. He said he'd been watching us. Isn't that what he said on that call? And y'all don't realize that's the world watching, your co-worker watching you, your neighbor watching you. We know how you are in church. God is looking for people that when you get out here, I was talking to people about how they do their business. People, uh, contract work, shoddy and second class. I was trying to teach that to a gentleman that we're supposed to have the best work. This should be the best time for people who take the time to do, do their jobs well. Or their business as well. Because there are so few people that do it well. So few people. This is the time. So what if we had a funeral right now? I told you guys in a Sunday service about three weeks ago, and I've written my funeral out already. But about three week, weeks ago, maybe about a month ago, I acted it out in my own mind. And I had all my speakers and all the people that were there. And people think that's morbid. But it really makes you start thinking about, I don't have a whole lot of time to waste. That means I, I can't stay running around hard-headed people. I pray for them and got to move on. Y'all got it? I got to protect my own peace. Some of y'all let people around you, they just take your peace. Could be your kids. You got to have a come to Jesus meet them, meeting with them. You got to protect your peace. I'm telling you, some of you will get healed. We pray, lay hands on you. Your bodies are completely healed if you get the stress out your life. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this time. Even though it's quiet in here, you're working on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we praise God in this place?
Come on, come on, come on. Can we praise God in this place? Here we go. Uh, Galatians 3.23. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Did y'all hear that? Whatsoever you do, do it what? As to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Y'all know what I found out when I read this scripture and started doing it? If I do it as unto the Lord, I'm a far exceed man. Expectations. If you do it as unto the Lord. If you repair something as unto the Lord and you keep looking at it, you make sure you do it right, then you get the customer and you say to them, hey, is that right? Can you work on it? So, for example, I've had people come do work and they do the work, but they wouldn't now make sure before they leave the house, the customer sees it working. Because what invariably happens, they say they fixed it, then they're gone. And then when you come to, to work on it, look like something wrong. So I don't let anybody leave my home without first knowing that you repaired it. Y'all got that? Yes. Somebody came and did some work on the TV, and they left, said it was working. I get there, it doesn't work. So now I got to make an extra call. So now I know you're not leaving my house. I'm not paying you until I see it working. Right? Because we're children of God. We also call to sharpen them and teach them. That's our job, lovingly. 